Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. This is, uh, I don't know how many we've done, but it must be 50 or 60 monthly reviews of what's going on in the fintech area. Our, our anchor for this uh, edition, as for almost all the previous editions, is Jemima Kelly, reporter for FT Alphaville and columnist for the Financial Times. Uh, she is... Uh, most recently, I guess, done a, a lunch with uh, Sir David Spiegelhalter uh, for the Financial Times, where the two of them at oysters together. Uh, <laughs> but she does; she is comprehensively backed up by two extraordinarily eminent speakers. Anders Lacour, the CEO of Banking Circle, uh, he's he's been with Banking Circle and its predecessor, Saxo Payments, for now eight years. He was formerly a lawyer in Copenhagen, and I'm going to give him a chance to explain what Banking Circle is all about, but it is a uh, fully fully licensed bank that provides, if you like, whitetail services to the rest of the financial services sector, and Dave Birch, David G.W. Birch, author, advisor, and commentator on digital financial ser services. His latest book is The Currency Cold War. He's also a global ambassador for Consult Hyperion, uh, a company of which he was a co-founder. My colleague, Leighton Hughes, and I will ask the questions if there are any questions that need asking, but Jemima, Jemima Kelly has an agenda, which I hope she will work through. But first of all, I'm going to ask Anders and Dave just to say what they're up to. Anders, tell us a little bit about Banking Circle. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for letting uh, me participate today. So I think Banking Circle is a financial infrastructure uh, bank that uh, was founded, um, actually the predecessor was founded in 2013. We launched to the market in 2016, scaled extremely fast. And in uh, the beginning of last year, we launched as a bank in Europe. Um, and we've then been running our, our business since then. What we are doing is we're providing accounts, we're providing FX capabilities, anything that financial institutions need to operate, um, especially with, you could say, the emerging of the fintech industry uh, a decade ago. Uh, we've seen a tremendous intake on that, and today we are settling uh, around 6% of the European e-commerce volume through Banking Circle. Um, so this is, in essence, what we do. Obviously, we, uh, we have high ambitions, so we're going to build our European business uh, to a global business over the next couple of years. Okay, well, probably by in the next six months. Dave, Dave Birch, what are you up to these days? Uh, well, actually, almost all of my time over the last couple of weeks has been spent on, on digital currency one way or another. And I, I know that's going to be a big part of what we'll cover today. Um, and the other part of it is I've been doing a little bit of international work, supporting some clients overseas, looking at the evolution, let's say the evolution of identity systems, because we still don't have one here um, and we'd rather need one. So looking at what's going on in some other countries has been useful recently. And what did you learn from it? I learned that I think uh, the government is right to adopt a framework based approach, much as they've done in places like Australia and, and Canada. Um, unfortunately, our framework is a little bit empty at the moment. Um, so we have a framework, but unfortunately it's got nothing in it, which is a little bit upsetting. But uh, they, you know, their, their hearts are in the right place. So <laughs> we're, we're heading in the right direction. It, it'll, it'll arrive about the same time as that train from Manchester probably. So we'll be okay. Okay, Jemima, you've been, uh, as I say, writing quite a lot, but in the newspaper as well as on FT Alphaville. Uh, but uh, the first issue I think that you and Leighton have identified is uh, the UK's uh, announcement that it was considering creation of a central bank digital currency, CBDC. What's your view on it? And tell us about how you think. Okay, so yeah, this was um, the announcement from um, the Treasury and the Bank of England on April the 19th that they are looking into, they've set up a task force for investigating um, creating a central bank digital currency. It's not actually been decided that this is actually happening, although they are actually hiring already for this team to look into it. They've got, I think, four jobs currently um, advertised. So they're obviously taking it seriously. It's been dubbed Britcoin. And um, clearly, you know, um, in this piece, uh, the lead talks about, you know, um, future proofing sterling against cryptocurrencies and improving the payment system. I always feel that that is a little bit 
um, oh, that's not getting the issue quite right. I don't feel that it's about future proofing sterling against cryptocurrencies. If we think about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum or things or Dogecoin, uh, I think it's about protecting, keeping, making sure the UK is kind of at the cutting edge, as Rishi Sunak himself says, making sure that we're competing with other central banks. So obviously China, um, the ECB, the Fed, I mean, all central banks are basically looking into whether they should issue central bank digital currencies. I don't think that anything that Bitcoin has really anything to do with it. At one point uh, in the in this article, it talks about ensuring against the possibility that payments might might migrate into cryptocurrencies over which they have no control. But like you can do that already. Like most of our money, as we know, is already digital anyway. If people were going to migrate into cryptocurrencies for payments, they could do that now. So, this is, so uh, for me, that's not really the point at all. Uh, so the kind of Bitcoin is a good is a good name, but it kind of by invoking the kind of idea of Bitcoin, I think it gets it makes that makes the issue a bit confusing. The one the one kind of type of cryptocurrency that could potentially be become a threat is a stable coin, um, which isn't really a cryptocurrency, except that um, it often runs on a blockchain. So in that respect, it is, but it's not the kind of traditional idea of a cryptocurrency, the kind of free floating, you know, driven by market impulses. Um, so if it were a, a stable coin, either on a, either a kind of cryptocurrency, decentralized stable coin, or one issued by a private company like Facebook, like DM that they're planning, mm -hmm. um, that I think is the, the bigger kind of um, threat, the idea that you could kind of um, transfer kind of some sort of um, control of like the monetary system to a private enterprise or even a decentralized network, which I think is less likely. Um, they're kind of guarding against the uh, the risk of that. I think the one thing this article doesn't uh, mention that I think is an important because you kind of you've got to think like what is the point? So so is it just a defensive? Is it just a defensive play? So are we just defending against competition from other central banks? Are we just trying to make ourselves look cutting edge? Um, are we just defending against things like DM? Or is there an actual? Could there actually be a kind of benefit to this? Um, and obviously one of the potential benefits, but it's also one of the problems is the whole kind of uh, uh, being able to weed out like, you know, illicit transactions. But obviously that then opens up the question of like, you know, how are we going to how are we going to have privacy? If we've got the central bank kind of keeping a ledger of, all, of everyone's transactions, how are we going to make sure that it's not keeping a tab on every single thing that we do? And in a country that actually Isabella Kaminska uh, my boss has a story on this today on Alphaville um, in which she kind of talks about the issue of would, would this have to be tied to a digital identity and what kind of data would be part of that digital identity? And do we need to, you know, we need to start having a conversation if we're looking into these things about how much of that we're comfortable with. Britain has historically not been very comfortable with kind of um, ID systems. Um, and we kind of need to make sure that the CBDC has a kind of, you know, is taught, has a kind of democratic process um, that kind of governs it and kind of steers what direction it's going in. So there's lots of kind of, um, oh, and sorry, the, the last thing I think that this, this thing doesn't mention is I guess the negative rates thing, which um, obviously now we're starting to worry about like runaway inflation again, but for a long time, you know, we've had, we've had rates, um, you know, very near to zero or below zero. And this would potentially, obviously, an, uh, a kind of digital M0, digital cash would be a potential way of stopping people, if it was replacing cash, stopping people uh, from storing cash and therefore forcing them to spend. So there are some, some kind of benefits, I guess. Um, OK, well, what you've said doesn't really convince me because I see this as nothing more than a digital form of sterling, exactly the same value. It doesn't float other than as sterling floats. And of course, they can track you because of that. Uh, the government knows more about you than if you actually had a £10 note in your hand. Um, of course, it could be that everybody gets a personal personal bank account with the Bank of England, but that's not going to happen either because the commercial banks have such incredible power. Is there any advantage to a, a central bank digital cash as envisaged at the present time by the Bank of England? Dave, do you want to, I feel like you should say Well, I, I think, I mean, first of all, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to highlight this, Jemima. I mean, I think it's a really important story. 
but the story has been a little bit lost, I think, in the in the kind of media refraction. There were actually two in. I mean, I don't know how Anders feels about this, but 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 actually, that announcement had two parts to it. It had here's something the Bank of England is thinking about doing, so therefore we're going to have a task force with the Treasury, and the task force is going to have two forums attached to it, one a technology forum and one an engagement forum. So I'll come back to that in a second. But the other part of that announcement got a bit lost, which was the which is what they're doing, which is they're creating these, these new types of settlement accounts called omnibus accounts, the Bank of England omnibus settlement accounts. And that, I think, is a really big deal. But it got a bit lost because it's a little bit technical and it's not to do with Bitcoin. But in essence, there are sort of two parts. To, I, I would characterize the CBDC in, in two parts. There's wholesale CBDC for, for financial institutions working between each other. And then there's retail CBDC for their customers. And wholesale CBDC is all tied up in this idea of you know, tokenization of assets, um, delivery versus payment. And of course, if you're going to start messing around with, I mean, they almost certainly won't be actual blockchains, but I mean, you get the general point. If you're going to start messing around with assets on chains, you need currency on chains, because otherwise you've got to come off the chain and find some way to link your chain to the existing settlement system. And in fact, the, the uh, you know, in Switzerland and in Germany, they, they've both been doing experiments around this. <clears throat> Six has had a rather inconclusive experiment doing it on chain, and saying, well, actually, you know, you could do it off chain as well and so on. But there are undoubtedly efficiencies there. So what the Bank of England is doing is saying you can issue tokens, essentially, um, that are in central bank money. And you can use these for, for settling all sorts of financial transactions on the chain. So I personally think that's a really big and really interesting story. I, I'm not sure um, uh, about, um, well, I think probably the the first license hold of one of these omnibus accounts is almost certainly going to be Finality, which is which is you know Barclays, Santander, Nasdaq, BMY, Mellon. I mean, all, I think there's 15 or 16 banks that are part of Finality now. It used to be called Utility Settlement Coin in the old days. You remember. And, and in terms of like actually transforming stuff that goes on in the city, I think that's a really big deal, um, and it, it possibly. I, d I think it went a little bit under the radar a bit. So, so that that's what sort of caught my eye when I saw the original release. I don't know. Okay, that. Anders, what's your view on that? I think if I I, uh, I can look at it from from our side as a as an infrastructure provider. I think yeah. what, what we what we look at is it's obviously very very early days, which is fine. So conceptually, we can have a conversation about it. But I think we we look at it from <laughs> from one angle. It's for us. It could be a new potential clearing. It's called yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and they are very uh, still, and you guys might have a better a better uh, answer to this than I have, but still I, I have a hard time seeing this unless the central bank keeps the uh, ability to completely control the monetary policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you completely have to control the monetary policy, there are <laughs> limitations to what you can do yeah. if, you, if you talk open net, or at least with the technical understanding I have. So there you've already narrowed the scope into something that, uh, as you said, Andrew, it could potentially work like in, we replace cash and now we just have a 10 note that we know exactly where it is mm -hmm. and where it goes. But, but at least short term, I have a hard time uh, seeing how you could do this better. And I think, let's say we came to a situation where some of the digital currencies would overtake the sterling, then I simply think you would have the government uh, interfering with this because you cannot lose the ability to set the interest rate or, or operate the macroeconomic as the way you should. But yeah, well, that's, just, uh, that's these untethered currencies out there in the, in the jungle. Uh, what the Bank of England is, is at least thinking about is something very much more in a cage. Hmm. Um, but Leighton, you, you had a, a point you wanted to raise. Yeah, it was it was um, so uh, another article by uh, your colleague Isabella Kaminska, uh, Jemima. Uh, the um, she wrote about how the Chinese central banks, uh, you know, officials there are not looking at this as having a um, blockchain. I think that was quoted as saying, um, uh, "Well, it was basically it doesn't need. Uh, well, it, it looks to have controllable anonymity, 
um, as the director of the Digital Currency Research Institute of the of the PBOC. So I think it's um, yeah. It, I mean, anonymity. There's an oxymoron for the future. <laughs> well, actually, I, I was in a I was in a round table with with Mr. Mu Chang Chung, the the director of the Digital Currency Institute, last week, as it happens. He's a very he's a very interesting chap. Um, uh, so controllable anonymity means not anonymity in our sense of the word. But um, but that point about the blockchain is quite interesting. China has opted, as I think we will do as well, to see digital currency in a slightly different. It, it isn't simply a replacement for cash. It's also a sort of backup. Um, you know, at the moment we spend enormous sums on on RTGS, Target 2, Visa Europe, and something like that, and they still go down from time to time. And um, and China, actually, as in the case of the Barbadian sand dollar, which was the CBDC that, that was missed out of the list at the beginning, there's this thing about if it really is going to serve inclusively, you know, the economy and blah, 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 it has to work when it's offline. You can't be online to do this all the time. So if the mobile network goes down or the power fails, I've still got to be able to go around to Waitrose and buy something to eat. And that means you have to have offline transfers. And if you have offline transfers, you can't use a blockchain because blockchains don't work offline. And in fact, Mr. Chan Chung you know, explicitly said before, <clears throat> even, even Libra, as it was then called, can't do this. That's a really interesting design choice. And... <clears throat> I don't want to second guess what the Bank of England's forums will will come up with, but I'm pretty sure we're going to make the same decision, and that means it won't be on a blockchain. Now, for the wholesale CBDC, that's a different issue. Uh, it, they, they may well choose to use a blockchain for that, and there's all sorts of good reasons for doing so. But for the retail, I don't see it. Jemima, you've always been sceptical on anyone. Yeah, I, I would I would question whether there are lots of good reasons for using a blockchain on the wholesale level. What, why would you want to use a blockchain? Would this be a private blockchain or a public blockchain? I think, well, pu public blockchain, I think probably not. And you certainly don't want to get involved in sort of proof of work and nonsense like that. Yeah. But, you know, there, there are some conceptual advantages to do with transparency and resilience, which would sort of make sense. So but those transparency and resilience um, benefits are only bestowed by a, a public blockchain. How can it? How I, can mean, I, don't mean, I don't mean transparency to the public. I mean, transparency to the market participants. Well, I, well, I don't understand. What, why, do, <laughs> why does well, a blockchain be is it any different from a not normal shared encrypted database? Uh, well, pff, blockchains aren't encrypted. I mean, I, I think the issue is, can we use, you know, some of the characteristics of that new way of doing things? That's different. That's different. Can we use, right. It doesn't mean that we'll have to use a blockchain, right? No, right. but it, it, that might just be the cheapest and easiest way of doing it. Because, for example, I, I have, a, I have I a, highly doubt it, but, but I have a, I have a deep and, and long held desire to fire all accountants, for example. and. Um, if you had this environment of ambient accountability where you were able to use some form of programmability to make market rules so that people simply couldn't write code that didn't obey the market rules, then you wouldn't need auditors. And that, and that would be a very happy day. We're in a fantasy world. Let's move no, on. Yeah, ambient accountability is... Um, goals. Okay, <laughs> next, next on your list. <laughs> Okay, next on the list is actually a kind of tech story that um, that kind of uh, it's not specifically fintech. It's a story that I did for how to spend it actually on uh, on these digital cleanse um, companies that are taking on cancel culture, as the headline says. I mean, it's not that's that's the slide. Uh, let's not talk about the headline, but um, I don't write the headlines. But um, what this is, I think, is a really interesting story. Um, so basically. Clearly, online reputation is more important now than ever before. And I mean, arguably, your online reputation just is your reputation, right? Like, it's especially during COVID. I mean, what else is your reputation? You know, if you're going for a job, someone's gonna, the first thing someone's going to do is going to look you up. If you're going to invest in a business, the first thing they're going to do is look you up. If you're going to go on a date, if you're going to hire someone, uh, or if you're going to go and work for someone, you know, it's, that is where our reputations are being managed. And obviously, um, 
there are all sorts of kind of things out there. For example, there are some sites that, that actually deliberately, you know, if people have a kind of um, beef with someone, you can actually deliberately like, you know, put out false stories about people, obviously. And so anyway, so this, what this story is kind of talking about is the fact that kind of traditional PR um, is actually becoming slightly less relevant um, compared with like online reputation management companies that actually specialize in online reputation rather than kind of in real life IRL reputation. And some of these companies, like there's this company called Terakeet, which was actually in charge of Obama's digital strategy in both of his election, successful election campaigns, are charging people, and this is individual people, are paying on average £150,000 a month. Uh, these are obviously high net worth individuals. Um, uh, to, to, to have their online reputations managed. And it's just, it's just quite an interesting, I think, development. There's, there's, there's a whole, that's the kind of high end of the spectrum. And then there's the low end, there's a company like uh, called Pure Reputation, which is based in London, that does things like creating fake social media profiles so that when someone looks you up, uh, someone, they then pay people to go and hit on the, on, on the fake profile so that that comes up ahead of your result on the Google, on the Google search results. And they're using pictures from like dead people to, so that no one's going to come back and have a go at them for using their picture. Anyway, it's all very murky, but it's quite an interesting, I think it's quite an interesting growth area. I, I don't suppose, Anders, that you're employing one of these people in your <laughs> position. <laughs> I can say I can say we are not, but I I um, I read the article actually, and it is it's it's quite an interesting phenomenon that you can uh, that you can both uh, like both as a private individual, but also as a company or as a CEO. Yeah, exactly. That, uh, that there was a couple of examples in the article of about BP, I think, uh, yeah. which and then the fact that if you start the process uh, at a point where everything is going well for the company. Uh, you're actually much better prepared than if you have to uh, if you have to uh, kill the fire that time. So, exactly. so uh, yeah, yeah. Jane, the, Jane, the, Jane the probably beat. does employ one of these uh, PR methods. hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think the, the 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 underlying thing here, which I think is a really serious issue, which actually I I, do, I don't want to get into it today, but I do think banks have a potential role in 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 solving part of this. But there is a real issue as we degenerate into this sort of Philip K. Dick world where you have absolutely no idea what's real and what isn't. And it's extremely destabilizing for people, I think. It's a, it's a serious problem. And, you know, it would be very nice to be able to sort of, you know, go to my Twitter feed and just tell Twitter, stop sending me tweets that don't come from real people, for example. That's, that seems like a very basic, simple, and we can't even do that at the moment. You can't even tell if if it's a real person. And actually, that's true for dating sites as well, to Jemima's point. So we haven't even got the basics in place for any of this yet, and yet the problem is sort of getting out of control. And one one thing I've I've argued for a few times, completely unsuccessfully, I have to I have to say, is perhaps co-opting some of the open banking infrastructure. I'm involved in one or two startups, one or two companies that are started that are moving in this direction. So basically, the idea is, if I want to know if you're a real person, one very easy way to do that is to get you to log into your bank account. But obviously, you don't want to send me any of your personal details. Or, well, you shouldn't anyway. But your bank could. So the bank could easily generate a cryptographic token that contains no personally identifiable information which simply says yes this is a real person and we know who they are and nothing more it wouldn't it would and then if if that token gets hacked or stolen or whatever then it doesn't matter you know so the idea of we we've actually built this open banking infrastructure however accidentally which sort of works but we don't really use it for anything interesting and for the average person it just means now there's a button in my app which says I can look at my nationwide building society account if I want to. I don't. It has nothing in it. Yeah, and other than that, it hasn't generated me any value. And yet, the seeds of some considerable additional value are buried inside that. And I, I know Imran, uh, the the OB, the Open Banking Implementation Entity, have, have, you know, more than once that the idea of of perhaps. In reality, they should have had a digital identity infrastructure first before they started building the open banking infrastructure. But, you know, we are where we are. So these are serious problems. But I, I think actually with a bit of imagination, fintech might actually have one or two potential solutions to some of this stuff. Jemima, you have a an excellent way of, of shoehorning fintech back into that. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I think it's, no, 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 yeah. it's a serious opportunity, but they don't think that way. You mm. know? Okay, let's continue with your agenda. Okay, great. So the next story is just a quick one. Uh, Charlotte Crosswell is leaving Innovate Finance. So she has been the chief executive of the basically UK's trade body for fintech since 2017. Uh, and she's now stepping down. Um, uh, the, um, the chief operating officer, Janine Hurt, is going to take over it on an interim basis. Um, I'm not really sure if there's much to say here other than clearly she's presided over a period of, you know, quite a successful period in UK fintech, I guess. Uh, Innovate Finance of kind of you know got quite a take quite a key role I guess they were they were on the co they were one of the um uh they were they were co-secretary Terriat on the um Khalifa FinTech review for example um but yeah I'm not sure we need to spend too much time on that unless anyone is has there, is there anything that any of the three of you would add to that I mean I, I, mean, I worked with Charlotte many many times I mean I, I I rather liked her actually I thought she did she did a good job of Where's representing state finance so where's she going I don't know where she's going next. I bet she's going to something ESG. That's my bet. I was thinking about that, and I was like, "Oh, I bet if you're gonna if you're gonna go from fintech somewhere, where would you go?" I was thinking you'd go to like green tech. I bet it's green tech. <laughs> okay, <laughs> green tech or Goldman Sachs. Uh, what's um, what's next um, on your agenda? So next is uh, it was actually this is a story uh, a column about why the delivery why the dark trace IPO wouldn't be like the delivery IPO. We've now had the Dark Trace IPO because this this um, fintech review was meant to be last week before that. Um, so uh, actually, the Dark Trace um, so Dark Trace listed on Friday, um, opening value of one point seven billion. I was thinking about the way that news is something I think about a lot. The way that like you know journalism's role in the world, um, and it's funny because I was looking up what what had been written about the Dark Trace IPO, and basically. Its shares rose as much as forty four percent on the day on Friday. Um, so clearly, that was like a successful, uh, successful listing. And I think people are quite keen for like Dark Trace to do well. It's like UK kind of our kind of proud um, cybersecurity Cambridge based company. You know, it's kind of uh, real technology. It's not just kind of adding tech onto like a word because it sounds cool and you think you're gonna. Um, you know, you think your valuation is going to be treated um, kindly, you know, in other words, you don't have to make any profits. <laughs> if you've got tech on the end of the, the industry that you that you say that you're in. This is actually real technology. Anyway, so the, the, the point is just that all of the all of the stories say, you know, really successful IPO debut. Um, the shares have actually fallen quite a bit since then. Um and actually, if you compare it to the Deliveroo IPO, which was kind of blasted, and obviously people have quite an issue with Deliveroo, the way that it treats its its riders and everything. Um, Deliveroo has actually, the shares have actually recovered somewhat since the kind of disastrous IPO. So it's kind of interesting because we've got, we kind of imagine now that the Dart Trace IPO was really successful and the Deliveroo was one really unsuccessful. Whereas now they're kind of roughly, but they're both down from where they debuted. They're roughly around the same. That was just a point about, about the way that kind of news happens yeah. because because but um, we just i mean what you're saying is is interesting the, the next two stories are very closely linked to it it's the uh, they're both industry stories the cma to block the crowdcube merger with cedars and the uk intervening in arm nvidia are we changing our entire approach to tech when it comes to uh, IPOs and indeed how we regulate and manage them? I mean, Dave, do you have a view on, either, on any of these three stories? The, the IPOs, I mean, <clears throat> I, I'm baffled as, as how you value these things. I've, I've never understood valuations. And this goes back to the days of lastminute.com. I've never really understood why things have a certain value. I couldn't tell you why they go up and why they go down. I assume it's because it's a thin, transparent, and easily manipulated market to the benefit of insiders. But there may be some randomness <laughs> in it. I'm not sure. As far as Nvidia goes, this is a huge story, and and it's it's fast. For those of us who are sort of reared on the mother's milk of Anthony Wedgwood Ben industrial policy, and you know Blue Streak and Concord and and goodness knows what else, the idea that you'll step in to block the merger of a company uh, to block the takeover of a company that produces in essence nothing is is amazing i mean arm is an incredible company and they don't make anything you know all, all those chips are actually made in 
you know, some vulnerable part of the world like Taiwan or somewhere like that. I mean, it's an amazing story that it, it's such an important part of our future prosperity. The design of the chips, not, not even making the chips, mm. which, we, which we couldn't make if we want to. So I, I'm fascinated by the NVIDIA story. But it is a big change in, in UK policy yeah. back, to, back yeah. to the 60s in a way. We've had Herman Hauser twice on these videos speaking passionately about the future of ARM. I mean, what is, what's your view on this, uh, Jemima? I mean, I do think it's interesting, isn't it, that the UK seems to be moving towards a more kind of interventionist approach. And I feel like that feels the case in Europe as well. I mean, clearly it seems like they are trying to be anti-competitive. Like, so Hauser has spoken out here against this. So this is something called the Grace Processor, um, uh, which is it's the, the company's first arm base. So it's um central processing unit. And apparently it's like it's it's um it offers data transfer speeds that are like vastly uh higher than other than 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 um than other companies and it's exclusively available to NVIDIA's customers. So it kind of feel, feels to me like his concerns are, are pretty valid and I'm kind of grateful that this is, uh, this is kind of, that the UK is taking a slightly more interventionist approach. Um, but yeah, it does feel like a shift, I think. Um, NVIDIA's customers, you know, when I, when I was a lad, NVIDIA's customers were people who wanted to play computer games. And, we, and, and you'd all buy the latest NVIDIA board to put into your PC or your Mac. But as far as I understand it, their biggest customers now are Bitcoin miners, aren't they? I mean, people use these graphics processors for not for anything fun, uh, but 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 just for cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrencies are fun. That's about all they are. I was waiting. I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What it means in terms of what it means in terms of financial services, I, I I don't know because if you if we go back to, I mean, I'm I'm a more sort of traditional, I'm a more traditional sort of liberal, i.e., Thatcher, Tory, you know, and and I want industries to be the most competitive and blah 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 and all that sort of thing. But on the other hand, when you think you know, one Chinese cruise missile takes out TSMC. Uh, and then there are no chips to put in washing machines. That that doesn't sound like the sort of world we want to live in. So so clearly something must be done. Mm. What? I have a clue. I I'm mean, assuming, Anders, that you don't want to come in on this, except that I could ask you about whether you feel there's been a change of UK government policy here, which is, I think, completely neutral. Any any thoughts on that? No, I think if you look at uh, if you look at the UK compared to uh, you could say. France or Germany or some continental European countries, where uh, the UK has historically been less protectionist uh, than uh, than the continental European countries, there I think there is uh, some kind of a change here with uh, with this reaction. Well, the French, of course, considered Danone yogurt to be a, a, a national security issue. Leighton, you had a, a point that you wanted to, to raise. Yeah, it was. It's more on the um, in reference to the Cedars Crowd Cube. Uh, you know, failed merger. I think that's really quite disturbing, actually, and something I'm particularly passionate about because you know these are two very innovative companies that was it was agreed and uh, then it was it was squashed effectively by this by the CMA on a definitionally flawed ground and definitionally flawed grounds, in my opinion. Um, you know, they have ninety percent of um, of uh, funding on on crowd on crowdfunding equity crowdfunding. But you know the the investment ecosystem is much bigger than that, and I think that's the problem. It doesn't include VCs, angel investors, national corporates. I think it's it's a real problem, and I think the DMU, which is within the CMA, I think it will be really interesting to see how they change uh, their approach if they do, because these are great companies, and you know uh, we we want to champion innovators, not uh, squash them. No, we want to squash them, I reckon. No, I'm joking. I'm joking, but I'm not sure I agree because 90% is like, you know, that's an enormous share. It's not just like 60%. It's not just more than half. It's like the vast majority. And I do think there are real concerns. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Like they've, they've, they, and they, they claim that they're not going to be able to, to kind of carry on without doing this. And clearly they're an important part of the way that SMEs fund themselves. But I do think that 
that having 90% of market share, and I take your point about there being other avenues, but I still feel like 90% of any market is just too much. Yeah, but it's ni- it's 90% of 1%, isn't it? I mean, well, yes, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic to Leighton here because I think we, we do want a more vigorous crowdfunding industry to compete much more strongly with other kinds of, of, of lending. And actually, I mean, personally, as somebody who used CrowdCube and found it a, a good and, and, and useful service. Um, I, why, I, would, why, why, why would bringing them together make them more competitive? Wouldn't it make them... Give them a little bit of scale and cut their overheads a bit. You know? Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm, not, I'm not ideologically uh, against it. I just... I, I just I think I wonder, you know, we 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 probably do need to find ways to make the overall financial sector more competitive. And, you know, we we've we've looked at business lending in particular several times, and, and yet it's still dominated by by two or three main players. And I, I think, you know, I think Lloyd's market share has actually gone up, hasn't it, in that space since since the CMA stepped in to to try and shake things up a bit. So I, I think it will be, I, I don't think it will be against the natural interest to let that go through. I really don't. So there we are. A split decision on that one. What's next on your, on your list, Jamal? The next one uh, is about UK fintech investment being off to a flying start after a series of mega deals. So um, they, uh, UK fintechs have attracted more than 3 billion in the first quarter uh, across more than um, 100 deals. And that's 153%. So almost tripling compared with the previous quarter and compared with last first quarter, it's up uh, more than four times. So up well, one would expect it compared with last uh, a year ago. I mean, a year ago. Well, we... we're talking about, I think we're talking about the first quarter. So actually the, the pandemic hadn't, didn't really affect the first quarter, I would imagine last year, because it kind of didn't really hit until like late March in, in the UK, did it? So or not that we knew of anyway. Um, So uh, so this is kind of encouraging. I mean, in some ways, I do feel that like it's it's not surprising that fintech investment is just going to keep growing because more and more finance labels itself fintech, more and more finance just is fintech um, by by that, the kind of the definition that we use, you know, like clearly like use of the internet is like carrying on, you know, digitization is carrying on. So like the idea that like, companies that cater specifically to online finance is, is not the, the idea that they're kind of proliferating is not particularly surprising. So I don't think we can just imagine that this is like, you know, just solely about like Britain's success as a fintech hub. I'm sure. Well, this well, is hang on. I mean, this is not an absolute, it's not just an absolute figure. How are we doing relative to other financial centers in terms well, exactly. of. Exactly. That, that's not actually those, those, those stats aren't in this story. So that's what I, that's the question I would ask. I mean, clearly I do think that the UK is doing really well. We've, we've clearly got a lot of, and I mean, as I've always said, I, I didn't ever think that Brexit was going to have a massive impact on like the London's attractiveness as a fintech center. Clearly it hasn't really so far. I mean, if you talk, if you, if you kind of hear what the, um, CEOs of some of these fintechs, checkout.com, that's just done a um, 450 million pound um, or dollar Series D and is now basically the UK's most valuable fintech at 15 billion dollars. Um, so, and the sec- that make- making it the second most valuable fintech in Europe after Klarna, I think. Um, clearly, if you listen to what they're saying, like there's no kind of talk of we need to. Um, some of them have had to set up EU headquarters, but none of them seem to be kind of trying to move their main headquarters out of out of London. Uh, so I think it's kind of a positive story. I just felt like I should kind of put in that caveat that I do think that clearly like, I mean, more than quadrupling sounds insanely, like insanely kind of rapid and large um, growth. But I'm just saying that we would have that anyway. Like, probably, you know. What, what do you have a view on this, uh, Dave? Well, I, you know, well, first of all, I, I think that keeping this momentum going is, it should be as per the Khalifa report, you know, a, a vital part of, of government policy. And, um, but I think some of Ron's recommendations in there are, are so, so for example, I mean, one of the obvious things to look at is people. I mean, why is it that people like checkout.com are, are here and hiring so many people here? You know, it's, be, it's, it's because of the people and the skills base. And yeah, I mean, yes, it's because of infrastructure, the lawyers and accountants, all that sort of thing. But I think a lot of it's got to do with people and London, however you want to level up and move things around the country and all this sort of thing. You know, London has a very 
it has a very cosmopolitan, high skill culture, which is very amenable to to to, to startups and and trying out new ideas and and somehow we've got to keep that going in a post Brexit era. And and we we've we've lost that thing where, you know, kids coming out of university all over Europe will come to London to to because it's the fun place to be if you're young and because there's the opportunity of joining these great startups and all this sort of thing. And I just I. I do have a concern that we that we won't be able to keep that going, despite Ron's recommendations. They'd rather go to Berlin. I mean, do you? Do you I think. Do you, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, I was just going to say. I. Oh, sorry. You go. You Andrews, go. Do you feel you can come in on this? No, so I think in general, if you see the fintech industry, and I, I don't know if it was uh, Jemima or, or David said that, like, the the definition of fintech getting broader and broader, and at some point, every business that has a client base will monetize on it. So, so the scope of being a fintech business uh, becomes much broader, and that's that essence. I would I would also have expected it to uh, to increase the level of of uh, of hundred businesses on around three billion is a lot. So that is that is is very encouraging for the UK. I would uh, I would think over time, continental European young kids would move to Berlin. They would also still move to London. Uh, and I can see why London is, is, is still attractive. Like as you said, the talent base is there. It won't just disappear overnight. Like the, 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 that's not how it goes. So you would, while these businesses grow, like just as a as a business like ours, I think we've doubled the intake of people in London uh, since uh, since uh, Brexit. We moved our headquarter uh, to Luxembourg. We've also hired a lot of people here, but. Fintech businesses tend to grow and hire a lot of people, and we also hire them in in, uh, in London because there are a lot of, of good talent there. Jemima, you with your four languages, um, uh, you're you're comfortable about London's position. Yeah, here. I mean, I, I actually always use language as the main. I think that language is kind of actually underestimated in terms of its importance. I mean, clearly Berlin is a very English speaking. Out of all the kind of European capitals, I guess Berlin is probably the most English speaking, but. But or capitals. When I say capitals, I mean I mean um, you know some some of them aren't actually capitals. Some of these some of the, some of these cities. But um, uh, I feel like the in, the fact that we have an English speaking country is extremely important. I mean, um, and then also like the kind of the kind of allure of London as a fun city. I do. I always just feel like is also underestimated. And obviously, then there's the talent. And obviously, the other the other point I always make about Berlin is that Berlin is not the financial capital of of Germany, um, and London is the financial capital of 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 obviously England. the UK, <laughs> well, of the UK, but also you know probably of Europe. Um, and I feel like that's also slightly underestimated because you know a lot of these fintechs are selling you know like Banking Circle you know is providing services to banks, and you want to be like close to the banks as well as to the tech companies. And so we have both. And I feel like that gives us a bit of an edge as well. Okay, continue down. Um, your list. So <laughs> next story, uh, one of mine, um, and Jamie's on Alphaville, the destructive green fantasy of the Bitcoin fanatics. So this was a story that we did on the back of a um, joint paper that had been put out by Square, Jack Dorsey's payments company. Uh, Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, clearly very kind of crypto uh, keen. Um, and ARK Invest, which is the um, ETF fund uh, house that's run by um, Kathy Wood, um, that has invested, that's done incredibly well on the back of investments in, in, in particular Tesla. Uh, and they put out this report called, that was called Bitcoin is key to an abundant clean energy future. Uh, I use the term kayfabe. Um, a lot. Um, it's a bit of a kind of obsession of Alphaville. I think it was it was Izzy that told me that kind of introduced me to the idea, uh, which is this idea that in, it comes from professional wrestling, and it's the idea that basically everyone knows that um, that what's happening is basically pantomime, is just fake, but everyone's in on the fakery, so it doesn't really matter, and they kind of uh, and so it's this kind of like mutual lie, and everyone's kind of in on it, and then it kind of makes it okay, and you see. You saw Donald Trump using that kind of technique in the way that he uh, ran his whole presidency. You know, um, he would he would kind of speak outright lies and it didn't really matter that they were lies because kind of the, the line between what was true and what wasn't was kind of blurred and his supporters didn't really care. And you see this. I mean, clearly, Bitcoin is destructive to the environment like that's it. it it's quite 
it's quite hard to 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 argue otherwise you could you could say that it's that you could you could make a lot of people make points that like yes but so is real money so is amazon so is other so is other stuff but clearly it's incredibly intense energy intensive and the more that the price goes up because of the way that the mechanics work the proof of work uh the more intensive it becomes um and so it seems to me to go back to the kayfabe idea that like you know how how to because and this is increasingly becoming something that people complain about and so how to guard against how to kind of fight back well literally put out a paper claiming the exact opposite it's key to an abundant clean future like i don't believe for a second that they believe that i really like i literally would put a huge amount of money on the idea that they do not believe that but they put it out as a kind of way of getting this this lie kind of to become a kind of half truth and that's what this that's what this 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 report is about and uh it's really quite crazy um i mean clearly there is some bitcoin mining done in places where there is excess renewable energy like iceland but actually it looks like increasingly that's that's not the case and most estimates kind of think you know it's really hard to actually find to, to know this stuff but most people think that the vast majority is done in china where like coal energy is still huge and um there was a coal mine that went went down recently in xinjiang province and that had a big effect, effect on the bitcoin bitcoin mining so it kind of seemed like just one coal mine had a big effect so this is just a ridiculous report that they put out and it seems to me obvious that, that that Bitcoin and other crypto that use this, the cryptocurrencies that use proof of work are um, damaging um, you, or are carbon intensive. Dave, do you have a few, anything to add on this before the lawyers come? Well, two points really. So one is, um, first of all, you see a kind of nascent, and I've seen this from a couple of different places now, you see people who are starting to talk about blood coins and green coins. And this idea that the non-fungibility of Bitcoin will actually turn into something far more interesting, because then you'll, you'll have a situation where, you know, insert name of famous green person here, I can't think of one off the top of my head, David Attenborough or somebody, um, will only buy Bitcoins that have an unimpeachable green history, which of course you can tell with Bitcoins. You can't tell this with gold or diamonds or something like that. But Bitcoins, you can trace back to their very origin. So, so you may have this weird market emerges where, where clean Bitcoins trade at a considerable premium to the dirty Bitcoins. And Jemima's right. I mean, for all of this talk about hydroelectricity and all this sort of thing and chasing geothermal and stuff like that, one coal mine flooded in China and it took out a quarter of the Bitcoin hash rate, end of. And I, and I will merely observe whether you're doing it renewably or not, unless you're using half of all the energy in the known universe, Bitcoin will remain vulnerable to attack. Hence my theory that when leading physicists such as Brian Cox eventually track down the dark energy, it will be because some alien civilization has started mining Bitcoin before us. <laughs> and that's where it's all gone. OK, we've got a couple of minutes, but only a couple of minutes. What's your next uh, ne next point on your agenda that you wish to cover? Uh, Dogecoin is on there. We can just quickly say Dogecoin is having a crazy time, partly because Elon Musk keeps tweeting about it. Elon Musk is going on to Saturday Night Live on Saturday, and now people think that he might mention Dogecoin. And so because Elon Musk is clearly the key driver of all markets these days, Dogecoin is going up. I mean, it's just completely the, the thing I love about Dogecoin is that all the kind of very serious crypto bros are kind of really quite outraged. This joke coin that was set up as a joke, explicitly as a joke, is actually outperforming Bitcoin. It's not quite as high, obviously, in terms of its price, but it's actually outperforming it in terms of its performance. And they don't really know what to say because they have to pretend that crypto is this really serious investment. And here there's this joke coin that's actually outperforming it. And they and it's all a bit embarrassing for them. To me, it's a perfect coin for our moment because like it is a kayfabe world, you know. Everything is a bit strange. Markets have become completely, you know, as Dave said, it's kind of always difficult to, to explain why a price goes up or down. But in particular, you know, that's become particularly the case during the past year. And so for Dogecoin to be performing well, it just seems like a perfect, perfect thing. Um, okay. that's, that's thing. Dave has just tweeted, or whatever the word is, uh, told me that he wants just to say a few words on the AI framework. 
And I wonder. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. First of all, first of all, Dave, and then uh, you get to wrap up, Jemima. Yeah, no, I just I just wanted to squeeze that in before the end. And that's because of my unshakable conviction that the future of financial services is so intricately related to, to artificial intelligence, not not simply because companies will use artificial intelligence to deliver services, but because they'll be selling them to artificial intelligences. You know, the idea that me as a customer, that I'll want to talk to my pension company, I don't understand the first thing about pensions. Of course, I'll want an artificial intelligence to do it for me. So the future of financial services is very, very intimately connected to the evolution of artificial intelligence. So early decisions on how we regulate, you know, we, we as a, in an industry, we should be having input to this. We shouldn't be leaving it to universities. And, and you know, I, I just feel strongly we should have more of a position on what what the sector wants, what what the finance sector wants from from this AI regulation and and the constraints, you know. Jemima. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting. I don't think that pensions would be a very good one for me personally for with AI because I think that opens up. Anyway, that's a slightly that's a slightly sorry. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, I think it's really interesting that the U, the U, EU is trying to do this. is the first attempt to kind of put AI into a kind of legal framework. Um, and actually, I was reading an article the Economist had done on this, and they were pointing out that there is a precedent for uh, for kind of the EU leading the way in terms of a regulation like this, which is GDPR, which has been kind of like widely globally kind of taken up. So. Um, and it's quite interesting. There's some quite specific stuff, like they've talked about unacceptable risks, including, you know, um, things that are clearly clear threats to um, the safety um, of people, including they, they use, for example, in, e.g. toys using voice assistance, encouraging dangerous behavior of minors and systems that allow social scoring by government. So it's quite interesting they've identified those as kind of particularly... Kind facial of identification, didn't they? they facial didn't... identification is considered high risk. They're not outright banning it. Facial identification is, is considered high risk. And They're shouldn't calling be for a pause, people. though, aren't they? Sorry? They're calling for a pause, I think, in facial recognition deployment. Are they? Yeah. Uh, I know that they were... I didn't know that. Um, they, they, I think that was they, the EU, they... or was it me? No, I think it was the EU. Well, they, they they've talked about um, they've talked they talk about substantial public interest um, reasons. For example, finding missing children, which could be used for um, for uh, you know facial recognition, could be used with that, which you could imagine like everyone would get on board with. It's a similar thing, actually. We think back to the kind of see, uh, bring us full circle back to kind of central bank digital currency. It's all very well thinking that they're going to kind of enforce some sort of privacy. But clearly, as soon as a child goes missing, everyone stops caring about privacy and someone wants to find a missing child. So it's it's really interesting to see kind of the, the way that ethics are being kind of um, thought about in these. OK, on that point, we have to bring this to a close. Can okay. I thank, as always, Jemima Kelly and Dave Birch and Anders Lacour and, of course, all of you for watching. Many thanks. <laughs>